we're uh, welcoming all of our audience members to this uh, discussion of African countries and the COVID-19 pandemic, political dynamics and policy implications. And uh, I'm really, really pleased that uh, the, the two people that we wanted to join us in this discussion and who, whose expertise and ideas we wanted to uh, bring into the conversation, uh, both immediately said yes and uh, were available uh, for the discussion. So uh, Kim Y. Dion and Ken Opalo, thanks so much for joining us and for making time today. Uh, Kim Y. Dion uh, will be well known to uh, many of our audience, probably all of, possibly all of our audience. She is a uh, assistant professor uh, at uh, UC Riverside, University of California, Riverside, uh, well known for work on public health, politics, democratization, governance in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and the author of uh, the recent book, Doomed Interventions, uh, The Failure of Global Responses to AIDS in Africa which has been extremely well received and of course is extremely pertinent to the, the issues that we're gonna be discussing today. Uh, we're also pleased to welcome Ken Opalo, assistant professor at Georgetown University, uh, which some of you in Washington may have heard of. It's just across town, um, short ride away. Um, but uh, seriously, we're delighted to have uh, Ken with us again, who delivered, uh, gave an earlier talk uh, in the program when things were relatively normal and we were thinking about other kinds of issues. Uh, Ken recently published uh, Legislative Development in Africa, Politics and Postcolonial Legacies. Uh, and I think uh, Ken, uh, Kim's book is uh, a bit earlier out uh, and has been very well received. I anticipate that for Ken's book uh, as well. Uh, and Ken wrote a recent uh, blog in his uh, in his online uh, publication or his online blog uh, on COVID-19 and some of the politics and policy implications for Africa. So uh, given the complementary expertise and, and the thoughtful interventions of both of our, our panelists today, we thought uh, this would be a good time for uh, a conversation about where we are uh, with COVID-19 on the African continent uh, what the political implications are in terms of policy response, in terms of relationships between international organizations and national governments, uh, the different social groups and economic sectors who are impacted by the health crisis, uh, and what this may mean for both the course of the pandemic and politics moving forward or looking ahead uh, on the continent. And so I think I'll start with you, Kim, and, and just ask, uh, well, you know, a couple of questions. But uh, the first question is, you know, just in watching the pandemic unfold, there is a perception, certainly in the media, that uh, Africa is uh, late in the cycle, let's put it that way, mm -hmm. not behind the curve, but late in the cycle. Uh, in terms of having, at present, a lower impact uh, in terms of cases and fatalities. Uh, and there's some speculation as to why this might be. Some people are, are thinking about demography and population densities. Other people are thinking about climate uh, and, and other factors. But there's also a political element here, which is that this is uh, far from being the first pandemic that the continent has faced. And so when you think about why Africa is where it is, what, what are you thinking? What are you, what are you seeing? Well, there's a couple of ways I would answer that question. So first is that um, Africa is a really diverse place. And so not every place on the continent is actually um, in the same stage of uh, pandemic. So for example, in North Africa, right, Egypt is the first uh, country on the continent to have a recorded case of COVID-19. And, you know, they have many more cases, right? And so I think Egypt, uh, Morocco, Algeria, even South Africa are a bit further along in their, um, in their stage of the pandemic than, than other countries. Right? So they certainly have more cases, 
um, but they've had cases for a bit longer than, than other countries. And, and even still, of course, as a region, right, on average, certainly Africa um, had cases emerge later uh, than, than other world regions, right? So Asia, Europe, and, and the Americas. Um, in, in, but I would also say that, you know, um, I'm not sure, there's so, there's so much we don't know about the coronavirus, um, COVID-19, right, this pandemic. There's so much we don't know about transmission and about susceptibility. Um, but as you, as you mentioned, right, there is some early evidence that it afflicts uh, older people uh, more severely, right? So the number of, of, of um, deaths is higher among the elderly. And obviously, African countries have a very different demographic pyramid, right? So if we think about structuring societies in Africa according to age, right, the bulge is, is toward the younger ages and not the older ages. And so, um, so the expectation might be that it might not be as deadly. Um, as for climate, I think, um, you know, there's, there are some studies that show that, you know, it doesn't, uh, the virus itself doesn't re respond well to heat. And so in warmer climates, we might expect that it, you know, it, it has less ability to, to be transmitted. Um, I think that that's still to be seen. Um, in, but this other, I think this other part of your question, right, this um, potential like latent capacity of African states to respond to a pandemic. Um, I, I think that that's probably um, not talked about as much in the media. And I think part of that is because of, you know, um, long standing stereotypes about the continent's ability to provide um, goods and services to citizens. But I do think when it comes to public health um, emergencies like this, that there, that in some places at least, there is some capacity that you know, developed nations don't have. For example, the ability to um, do widespread testing and tracing, um, largely because of experiences with, say, Ebola in West Africa and, and um, Democratic Republic of Congo, but also the HIV AIDS pandemic, which has been ongoing for decades. Right? This, is, this is a disease, you know, HIV is a disease that you know, has, has um, one of the best ways to fight it has been making sure people know their HIV status. So it requires testing. And so I think that um, having those experiences in the past, right? So having generalized HIV epidemics or having been exposed to Ebola has made, ha has created some capacity, I think, in African settings that, you know, we don't see in, um, in Western industrialized nations. Right. Yeah, I was looking today at a list of uh, prevalence, you know, based on the current, uh, the, the best current statistics. And I mean, it's interesting, some of it's intuitive. South Africa, Nigeria, and the North and the Maghrebi states are, and Egypt are the most uh, seriously affected right now, along with a couple of countries like uh, Cameroon and Ghana. Uh, and Cote d'Ivoire, which are maybe a little less intuitive, but they're countries with uh, high connectivity, um, population densities in certain areas, um, more urbanized. Uh, and so that makes, that makes some sense. Um, and, but how it's gonna play out, I mean, since it's now in all 54 states of Africa and how it's gonna play out differentially, is, is really a, you know, the, big, the big question. And you've referenced uh, experience with previous pandemics and those kinds of uh, public health responses. And you know, we remember the dire predictions and forecasts uh, at the beginning of the Ebola uh, pandemic, which unlike HIV AIDS rolled out you know, very quickly. I mean, AIDS was a slower moving disaster. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, in countries with very little capacity, that was, that was contained and managed uh, largely through aggressive contact tracing, isolation, uh, and, and so forth. And so I wonder if we think about the diversity of responses, um, and I'll bring Ken into this too, but we can start with you. We think about the diversity of responses. The the factors that came to mind in thinking about this were one, this this question that you reference, previous experience, but then also state capacity, mm -hmm. 
Um, to what extent are there uh, existing endowments of you know, communications, public health, and so forth? State capacity and regime type. Does the type of regime matter? Um, so I wonder how that strikes you in terms of factors that might affect differential responses across the continent. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think state capacity certainly matters. Um, you know, the earlier political science research uh, would suggest that regime type also matters, that uh, more democratic regimes will uh, provide better public goods and services to their citizens because they, you know, they, they have to in order to be, you know, continually reelected into office. Um, and I have some work with Karen Greppen that ex explores this in particular with the um, universal healthcare coverage, right? So mm -hmm. countries that had, you know, African countries that had, um, you know, uh, more entrenched democracy, right? So real competitive elections, right? You're more likely to see things like universal education, universal healthcare, um, right? These, these kinds of universal benefits that, that are investments in, in uh, a country's future. Um, I do think that, you know, these, um, those those things are important, um, but one thing that is hard to to do, I think, immediately is engender trust among the public. And I think that there's been great work on how public trust in government um, and and public trust in others really matters for adopting public health campaigns. So hand washing campaigns or, right, and we, we saw this, um, so Rob Blair, Lily Sai, and Ben Morris wrote a piece on this during the evil outbreak uh, based on research that they had done in Liberia that people who were less trusting of government were, you know, less likely to, you know, ex, you know engage in healthy behaviors that would have mm -hmm. pr protected them from getting infected with Ebola. And then we have this new article that's forthcoming from Alison Grossman and Leo Ariola, political scientists at UC Berkeley, who look in particular at marginalized communities. And I think that this matters in epidemics like this um, that, that can affect specific communities more than others. Um, that when that marginalized communities in particular that, that have been marginalized by the government may be even less likely to listen to these public health campaigns. And it's going to require not just the state capacity to do all of these things, right? But uh, it's going to depend on this, the state's history of treatment of all groups of people in, in a nation, for, for all groups of people in a state, for all of them to want to comply to, you know, pretty rigid um, rules to protect um, and, and contain the spread, right? And, and it's going to require kind of buy-in from leaders within those communities to, to act as messengers of those public health campaigns. Um, and, and that, I think it's, that's going to be, that's going to be harder to do, right? That's not like you just go outside and you build an isolation unit, right? That, that's going to, that, those kinds of um, trusting relationships take time to build. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm reminded of the challenges in Nigeria, northern Nigeria, in, in the anti-polio campaigns. And that was just vaccination. That wasn't any elaborate isolation or, or you know, behavioral change. Um, but marginalized communities reacted quite badly because they didn't trust the state. Uh, and therefore, you got lower uptake and actually, you know, considerable resistance to that. Ken, you know, um, this, this question of, uh, of, of state capacity of trust, you reflected on the accountability of elites uh, and uh, the problem of targeting uh, policies toward different sectors and different populations. I mean, what are you thinking about when you're looking at uh, either the case of Kenya, uh, which you're closest to, but also as you do comparative work as well, um, you know, differential responses around the, uh, around the continent. Yeah, I, I guess <clears throat> one, of, um, one of the questions that hit me when, when African countries started responding uh, was just how similar their responses were to uh, wealthier countries, right? So especially, uh, you know, uh, Western Europe, uh, questions of, you know, shutting down the economy, um, uh, requiring uh, or trying to set up testing, uh, envisioning a quarantine regime uh, that was, uh, in the case of Kenya, also very similar to China uh, to some extent. 
Uh, and, you know, a lot of the responses struck me as not in tune with the realities on the ground, uh, right? So, you know, if your economy is 80% uh, daily uh, wage on us, right, right? The idea of shutting down uh, may not, you know, shutting down the way a country with huge uh, levels of uh, rates of formal employment might do it may not, you know, apply to a country like Kenya or Nigeria. Similarly, you know, if you're 75% rural, uh, right, uh, you may want to have a different strategy for your urban areas versus rural areas. Uh, and then finally, when you're thinking about how to stimulate the economy or uh, help cushion the economy, uh, right, it's not enough to just go uh, 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 through the formal policy channels to help, uh, quote unquote, formal businesses, but also to think more broadly uh, as to how you can get this done. Uh, and so, you know, in, in the case of Africa, it, 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 African countries, it became very interesting observing this. And so part of my reaction was, you know, the question of uh, why did African countries rush to implement these policies that were replicas of uh, policies that were being implemented elsewhere, as opposed to initially thinking through, because they had a lot of lag time, right? Uh, mm -hmm. as, as, as Kim pointed out, Egypt, you know, the Nile cruises were the first to be hit. So African countries had quite a bit of lag time uh, within which they should have thought about policies that were more in tune with their uh, objective realities on the ground. And I think the answer to me was that, uh, you know, African countries haven't invested in the capacity to make their populations legible and to link their policy, uh, their populations to formal policy making. Right, Nigeria, uh, which you're familiar with, I think is the is a, is a caricature example of this because you know Nigeria is a massive country, Africa's biggest economy, that spends a sum total of 12% of GDP in public expenditures. Uh, just to put this in perspective, right, Nigeria is almost 200 million people, Kenya is about 47 million, and the two have the same uh, spend the same amount in dollar terms, so about 30 billion dollars every year in public spending. Uh, so that tells you that, you know, Nigeria is a libertarian paradise where the government does <laughs> almost nothing, uh, right? And so when something as big as this hits, uh, uh, there's no, there are no built-in channels to transmit policy from the government to the populations. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think uh, uh, that was, you know, the, the, the thing that motivated the piece and just thinking through how sort of helpless uh, policymakers were in this situation, right? And we then forced them to do what was being done elsewhere uh, because that's all they knew how to do. Now, luckily, uh, right, this general neglect by the state has meant that uh, African peoples, right, across the different countries have actually learned ways to survive without, you know, state policy intervention, right? So social protection is very, is, is a minuscule sector uh, as far as public spending goes on the continent. Uh, yet, you know, people have connections to rural areas, to relatives uh, uh, that is allowing them to take care of some of the income shocks uh, that have hit them during this, uh, this crisis. And, and then, you know, uh, uh, Kim uh, made the great point that because of the experiences with disease outbreaks, cholera, HIV, Ebola in some countries, there are these public health surveillance systems that have allowed some of the more higher capacity countries to actually have systems that can help them track the disease across their uh, populations. So it's a mix of, you know, uh, I would say autonomous resilience among the populations, uh, a bit of helplessness as far as policymaking goes, uh, you know, for policymakers and government officials. Um, and then, you know, some capacity that was developed uh, historically because of other diseases that have been, has been repurposed uh, uh, to take care of uh, the COVID emergency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I just say, you know, Please. one of the things I really liked, um, so I really liked your, your piece that you wrote, Ken, and it made me think about, um, you know, this isn't, you know, this isn't the first time that African countries have faced serious health emergencies. And... Um, and leaders in the past did respond in their own unique ways, right? Totally divorced from, you know, what was expected of them by um, international funders, right? So what comes to mind, for example, is like you're wearing the 70s campaign against AIDS, right? I mean, yeah. 
you know, you can hate M7 for all sorts of reasons, right? But his early response to AIDS has been widely heralded as an exemplar, right? And, and um, one of the things that he did, for example, was trying to promote um, uh, faithfulness, right, in, in families. And because that was a way of maintaining, right, of, of, of stopping spread. And, and he used the term zero grazing, right? So he used, he used um, like a cultural repertoire to like come up with something that wasn't like, you know, just a, I don't know, a copy paste version of a public health campaign, right? Um, now, of course, the flip side to that are, you know, other, other political leaders who also went their own way, but, but you know, it was horrible, right? So Tavo and Becky's, you know, courting AIDS denialists in South mm-hmm. Africa when, you know, and, and then depriving um, pregnant women from accessing um, essential drugs to prevent the spread of HIV from mother to child. So, you know, um, you know, I, I'm not sure, you know, that the best, that, that, that on, on average, we're getting better outcomes. Um, in terms of like health, like I, I, I want to, you know, really scrutinize the numbers on that. But I do think that, you know, there is a precedent, right? It doesn't have to be that, you know, this is something that, um, that is unique or new, right? There, there's a precedent for political leaders to come up with their own solutions that they think fit their countries um, best, or not even just their, their countries, but like, political leaders at a more local level, right, can say, like, this is what suits what what my community needs, and this is what we're going to do. But I think that requires, you know, knowing um, something about the state you're leading uh, and the people that live in it. And I, and, you know, what I really liked about Ken's piece was just, you know, the raw numbers of how many people depend on um, agriculture for their livelihood, you know, would suggest that that's where government should be targeting um, programming, not, you know, small business loans, you know, for yeah. For and and you know, uh, to your point, I think I think right now, you know, you're seeing, uh, uh, you know, the Dembeki or Yaya Jama version play out uh, with COVID, right? Um, you know, promotion of untested uh, therapeutic solutions to the problem. Uh, or, you know, governments that are not taking uh, sort of social distancing measures seriously, uh, which will continue to impact uh, uh, regions, uh, even if, say, I, I think Museveni, uh, this, this, uh, over the last couple of days, issued this interesting statement, right? So he basically made the case that you can think of the East African community as a house and so it makes no sense for the bedroom to be quarantined and 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 contain and be able to contain the disease if the living room uh, is is not uh, doing the same. And I think this was a veiled sort of reference to uh, what's happening in Tanzania and Burundi, both countries that are not perhaps uh, doing what's expected of them. Uh, and I, I think you know it will make little sense for say Kenya or, or Uganda to contain the uh, outbreak if uh, other countries within the East African community don't do so, uh, because there's quite a bit of labor mobility uh, across the region uh, that will have implications beyond any one country's borders. So then is there gonna be a possibility for policy learning either regionally or across the, uh, across the continent? I think, I, think, I think so. I think, uh, I mean, obviously we're still in the moment, right? Um, I think I think there's definitely uh, an opening here for policy learning, uh, given that everyone ex- is experiencing this at the same time. So minds are focused on the policy gaps, uh, and within Kenya, I should say that I have been impressed by a few governors who really stepped up. So the governor of Mombasa, who you know for a while wasn't doing the best job in the world. Uh, but has really stepped up uh, during this epidemic and uh, is arguably the best performing governor in response to uh, this crisis right now. Uh, similarly, in the health ministry, they've, they've been doing the, uh, uh, the right things, although you know, qu- the quarantine system is now you know, veering towards the direction of being more like detention, which is mm-hmm. disincentivizing people from voluntary testing and all that. So I think there need there needs to be some tweaking of uh, you know how quarantining is done. Uh, 
uh, and uh, I, I think across the continent, there will be scope for policy learning. And I hope one of the policies uh, that governments learn is that uh, you can't just continue flying blind, uh, right, and, and hope for the best. And that, and that, you know, you can't always globalize your domestic health emergencies, uh, right? So when Ebola breaks out in Liberia or the DRC, the WHO and the CDC swoops in and helps through. Uh, right, that doesn't happen when everyone in the world is going through the same problem and everyone is occupied by their own domestic problems, especially in uh, traditional donor countries. So, you know, these countries, I hope, will realize that you need to build your own capacity. You can always get help, uh, but when everyone is hit at once, it 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 makes sense to also have some reserve domestic capacity to uh, deal with emergencies like this. Yeah, and I'm optimistic that um, regional organizations are going to be um, a good conduit for policy learning. So the African Union, um, and in particular, the Africa CDC, which the African CDC, um, you yeah. know, for anyone who's in the webinar, they have the mm -hmm. best statistics on, you know, like the best, most accurate, most up-to-date information about COVID-19 from all countries on the continent. And, um, you know, and it's so easy to, to navigate and use and, uh, and I think that, you know, um, though a relatively young group outfit, you know, I think that, um, that they, they have some experience, you know, in the past with working with disease outbreaks and with um, kind of coordinating health efforts across countries. And I think that, you know, this is going to be um, an unfortunate opportunity for them to really test their ability to influence health ministries and, and political leaders to adopt the policies that are working on the continent, right? Yeah. And, 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 and you know, to, to build on Kim's point, one of the, so looking at different sectors, say water, agriculture, economic policy, education, health, uh, I think is, is the biggest success story as far as uh, global development goes on the continent. And, and that's, also, that's partly because of just the density of human capital in uh, different African countries, uh, right? Because if you think of, you know, education, the education sector, uh, or if you think of, you know, traditional you know, economic development sectors, uh, right? There's often quite a bit of uh, uh, foreign involvement in, in, in advising and, and whatnot in those sectors. Well, in public health, I think the collaboration, uh, even, you know, between the US CDC and African CDCs or the WHO in African countries often involves quite a bit of domestic input and domestic systems. So I, I think um, in, in that regard, uh, the health sectors in different African countries are well positioned to glean up uh, the right lessons out of this. Now it's a, it's a separate question whether, question whether the governments will uh, take heed of, of, of those lessons. Yeah. Yeah. Kim, you've written uh, extensively and thought extensively about that that relationship, the international uh, inter international organizations, international NGOs, their templates, their best practices, top down, outside, you know, to to domestic kinds of interventions, and when and why uh, they they fail. And I'm just wondering if this is kind of a moment, not only in terms of the particular nature of, of domestic and international uh, relations around health, but also a, it's a moment where we're seeing kind of a collapse of global leadership and global coordination. And so for uh, better or worse, it's reasonable to say that in the AIDS pandemic and in the Ebola pandemic, uh, you had a degree of leadership uh, certainly with, uh, backed by a lot of resources from the U.S., coordination between the CDC and the WHO, and a kind of a scientific and policy consensus. Uh, it may have been misguided, it may have needed to be tweaked, it may have needed domestic, you know, responses. But I think we're not seeing that at all. I think what we're seeing now is, is a kind of collapse of global coordination, and, and therefore, uh, kind of analogous to what we're seeing at the uh, state level within the US, uh, an international response that, well, we're kind of on our own here. We have to improvise. We can't, we can't rely on external models or external resources. 
Yeah, so I'm actually teaching African politics this term, and, uh, and I liken what's happening to, um, to World War II. So, right, we talk about how um, one major force in the move for independence in African countries were soldiers returning from having served in colonial armies in World War II and seeing, you know, right next to them in the same foxhole, white men die, right? When they get, when they get hit by bullets, they die. They're not special. Right. And I and and so I see this pandemic as America doesn't know what to do when there's a disease outbreak either. Right. Boris Johnson was in a special care unit. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the leader of, you know, the, the country that used to be the king of empire. Right. That guy was in a special care unit. Right. Like the, the like other places are vulnerable, too, and they don't actually know how to do anything. And so um, I, I, I see this as a moment of you know, those people, they may not, they don't even have the answers for themselves, right? How can they tell us what the right answer is? And, um, and I think the challenge as, you know, as, as Ken has put it, I think the challenge is that might be well known. I think that might become more well known among citizens in African societies. Um, how well the leadership in, in these African states um, respond to that. Now, that might just be a crisis of leadership. Um, and, um, and, you know, we're going to have to see, you know, whether, you know, here are these guys who have been depending, and of course, they're mostly men, right? Um, mm -hmm. They've been depending on the largesse of uh, the international, you know, I don't want to call them donor community, because sometimes it's loans, but, you know, the international community that has been propping up their um their kind of status quo rule right i i i just don't know how quickly they're going to or if ever you know they're going to see that you know that's not a sustainable model f for even my own continued incumbency right let alone a sustainable model for my country's growth and development in the future yeah yeah i mean and i i think i think the learning is happening in at least among uh, African middle classes, right? You're beginning to see this understanding that, uh, because uh, so in the piece, uh, I did a bit of hand waving about, you know, political thought in Africa. And, you know, even the, the, the African NGO class, if we may call them that, right? Uh, uh, there have been, you know, decades of dependence on international best practices, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, some, some of those made sense for the African content, context, some did not. Uh, and I think the shattering of this myth that, you know, uh, in the international community, the international community here being, you know, Western Europe, the US, Japan, and New Zealand, Australia, right? The idea that the international community knew everything, I think shatter, the shattering of that myth will help and create an impetus for uh, domestic knowledge production. And, and, and I think that process will help, right? Because uh, uh, you know, I think that the act, local activism and, and drive to push for policy change uh, will become a thing once we get out of this notion that all we need is expertise and well-packaged uh, knowledge and then we can just apply it, right? Uh, I think uh, that model has made it such that knowledge production happens elsewhere in African countries are just supposed mm -hmm. to apply it. Uh, if we get rid of that myth, then we will emphasize uh, domestic knowledge production and that knowledge production will then feed into the messy process of uh, uh, advocacy and politics. Uh, and, and that will infuse the learning process with more depth, uh, I think, uh, with potential for greater success uh, in the long run. Yeah, and one other thing I wanna say on this idea of like this, this role of the international um, kind of making priorities for the continent is, you know, um, COVID-19 is serious and it is seriously affecting African countries. African countries are also facing other serious crises, right? Um, I'll leave it to Ken to talk about the economic effects of not just COVID-19, but the, the fact that COVID-19 has affected the entire global economy and what that means for African economies. Um, but there's also a serious problem with locusts in East Africa that are going to devastate um, agriculture in, in East Africa, right? We're, we're gonna see some serious food shortages in East Africa in the next year and a half, maybe longer, right? There's also a really terrible malaria outbreak in Zimbabwe, right? So there are other 
other things happening, whether that's, you know, other health priorities or um, economic or agricultural priorities, there are other problems. And so just as is typical of the international community, they're trying to to treat this one thing as really exceptional, right? And so for anyone who hasn't already, I, I highly recommend Adia Benton's book, HIV Exceptionalism, which kind of puts, um, I think gives us two things to think about when we make something like COVID-19 exceptional. Like one, it's at the expense of other health issues, right? We wanna strengthen health systems broadly so that you know people's health you know, broadly are taken care of. So not just like, are there enough ventilators on the continent to deal with COVID-19, but are there enough anesthesiologists and respiration therapists, even when COVID-19 is over and people have, you know, other pulmonary issues, right? Um, but also, you know, are there enough community health workers, you know, getting paid to do their job, not asked to volunteer to do their jobs in, in rural areas so that people everywhere are getting access to healthcare, not just people who live in cities, right? So, so one is like the, the, health, the health side of, of um, exceptionalism, like it might rule out, you know, attention on other health issues. But the other thing about exceptionalism is that um, it, it, it makes people focus on, on a health issue, but it doesn't take into consideration that you know, citizens are navigating other basic needs issues, right? Not just, um, you know, the potential infection from this um, virus, right? They have other, you know, they need access to clean water. They need regular, you know, um, they need to regularly feed their kids. You know, people need um, their kids to go to school so that they can work and make a living. You know, there, there are basic needs that people have that are not just about, are they going to get this you know, highly infectious virus um, and then get very sick from it, you know, there are other, they have lives to live, you know, and there's more to their life than whether or not they're going to catch this. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I, I think as you're right, Kim, this is a shock that uh, is exposing lots of gaps. Um, you know, you mentioned education and uh, one of the, uh, in, a couple of weeks back, the Kenyan uh, ICT minister made the claim that, you know, Kenyan kids will have online learning. Uh, and this caused quite a bit of uproar, right? Uh, because, you know, that means a tiny sliver of kids in, in the urban areas and a few rural homes uh, would have access to this. And so, you know, it just feeds into this sense that the, the ruling class is completely uh, out of touch yeah. uh, uh, with, with the reality on the ground. Uh, and I think, you know, when you think about economics, right? So. African governments have been uh, making noise about debt cancellations or, uh, you know, reprieve uh, during this calendar year. I think the problem will only get worse. Many of these loans were misspent on, uh, you know, white elephant projects, mm -hmm. uh, right? Uh, you know, so Kenya built a brand new railway for, you know, anywhere between three and $4 billion. Uh, that's not making any money. Uh, COVID has stalled the economy, meaning that it will not be able to service that loan uh, uh, and therefore will most certainly need some reprieve from China. So, you know, COVID is exposing these bad investments uh, and the fact that they're, they're not going to pay off and now it's going to get even worse. And uh, because of that, it will also rebalance some of the continent's relationships with uh, countries like China uh, or, you know, the private sector in Europe that has been bankrolling the Eurobond uh, issues over the last 10 years or so. Uh, so, you know, China will most certainly be forced to uh, do something about the debt uh, that African countries owe it. Uh, uh, the Paris Club is talking about private sector uh, debt forgiveness as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and then, you know, forgetting if, if we leave the, the debt problem aside, right? Thinking about education, water, agriculture, uh, right? So, you know, you mentioned the locusts in East Africa, uh, the floods, mm -hmm. uh, the flooding situation has hit uh, Northwestern Kenya really hard. Uh, about three dozen people died a couple of weeks ago in a mudslide that barely made the headlines uh, in Kenya because of COVID. So there are all these other things that uh, governments uh, should have systems to take care of. Uh, but as you said, because uh, I think development or government policy on the continent has happened in this context of exceptionalism so that each administration only seems to be able to do one thing at a time. Yeah. 
as opposed right. to building resilient systems so that, you know, every day people in education do what they're supposed to do, help do what they're supposed to do, as opposed to, you know, DFID is giving us 400 million for education. So that's all what, you know, we're doing and that's what the treasury is focused on. Uh, so I think this crisis is exposing a lot of these gaps that African countries have to deal with and think about moving forward. Uh, how do you build the systems needed to run a country uh, uh, moving forward? Because, you know, the, the youth budget we've been talking about is about to become, you know, uh, not just a youth bulge, but, you know, a big number of people in the middle age. Uh, so, you know, in the next 10 years, they'll no longer be teenagers, right? You'll have people in their, you know, 35 to 45, 50, uh, who need a lot more than, you know, just being able to eke a living uh, through agriculture. And, and African governments, again, they're not thinking about that yet, uh, 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 given how, how money is spent on the continent. Yeah, one outlet that is also under pressure here is remittances. Yeah. Um, and governments have relied on remittances, uh, particularly over the last 15 years where there's been such a huge uh, exp you know, growth uh, of, of remittance flows uh, into African countries. And that's down by at least 25% now uh, because of the, uh, because of the, the, the pandemic and, and the economic uh, decline. So it's really gonna push a lot of governments very quickly into a situation where you know they're under debt pressures, there's not a there's not a sort of comp compensatory finance that flows to families and and households and and communities through uh, through through uh, uh, you know external um, uh, external uh, remittances, and so uh, this is really going to put a lot of governments uh, under severe pressure. The other point that you rightly emphasize is, you know, it's, it's equivalent to many political and security crises too. If you treat each pandemic as just a crisis, we swoop in, we intervene with uh, a package of policies and intensive resources. And then once it seems to be contained or it seems to be subsiding, then we can move on as in the international community can just move on. And we don't have to worry about that. I mean, one is reminded of the uh, the Civil War and and the uh, the coup in Mali. You know, you swoop in with an intervention, and then okay, it's it's dealt with, and it leaves a trail of festering problems that are continually uh, erupting and and uh, creating additional problems. So you're really both raising the question of. a broad provision of public goods uh, and some kind of social contract. Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, the, um, well, I, I should, I should note, and some of Kim's work uh, actually highlights this, uh, right? So the, the advent of electoral competition in the nineties has actually created quite a bit of demand for public goods and services and governments have responded to, in some respects. Um, and so, you know, while we, or, or I lament uh, about, you know, the huge gaps that still exist, it is true that the trend uh, has been in the right direction. And, and, you know, one of my biggest worries is that this crisis may dent that trend. Uh, so, you know, African countries implemented universal primary education with all the problems that, you know, came with that. Uh, many of them, uh, you know, got surprised that, oh, if you have so many people in primary school, they will need high school. So now, you know, the, the big policy question in education on the continent, uh, if, you, if you look at the last elections in Ghana, Kenya, and mm -hmm, elsewhere, mm -hmm. Tanzania, secondary education. So they're dealing with that. Uh, and, and Kenya has also been dealing with tertiary education. So uh, they, you know, governments are responding with these massive programmatic policies. And some of my work in Tanzania shows that it's 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 very nonpartisan. These some of you know these policies are actually programmatic, uh, in the sense that they're universal and they're targeting everyone. Uh, so it would be a shame if if the uh, fiscal crisis occasioned by uh, the epidemic stalls some of these developments. 
and, and I think a, a question that donors uh, or the well wishers or, or debtors should be thinking about is making sure that the gains that have been made over the last 20 years are not eroded by a crisis like this. Uh, because it's, it's only by surviving this somewhat intact that uh, African countries will be able to bounce back. And I think they will. I think, I think this time is different than the early 80s. Uh, I don't think we'll, we'll go through a crisis as bad as that, but uh, uh, it will be bad for a few years, I think. Yeah. Ken, I'd be curious to learn more about the work in Tanzania because um, a, a paper I wrote with Jeremy Horowitz on a universal program in Malawi, um, what we found, it was interesting. So this was, right, this was the agricultural input subsidy program in Malawi, which was trying to provide a, a subsidized fertilizer to smallholder farmers so that they, because the, the fertile is so in, the, fer the soil is so infertile in Malawi that you really, it's hard to apply, mm -hmm. it's hard to grow anything if you don't apply fertilizer. And so, um, so this program was, you know, it was a universal benefit for anyone who's a smallholder farmer, for the most part, right? There's obviously some problems in implementation. And what we found was, you know, even as much as people talked about nepotism or favoritism in targeting of the good, it, it was, you know, roughly speaking, pretty universal. And then people rewarded the incumbent. So, so you know, if there's any African leaders listening, um, here's an <laughs> idea, like, if you want to win the next election, you know, provide universal goods to people because they remember that um, that you did that. And so, um, you know, I, you know, so I, I have a caveat to that. Okay. Okay. What's your caveat? So the, the caveat is so uh, so I have a paper uh, that uh, we're working on with Musa Blimpo and Justice Mensa focusing on electricity and uh, the gist of the paper is that connecting people to the power line is good, but if the power, if power keeps going out, it sours the relationship. So uh, yeah. access earns you vote, but a bad experience post access actually loses you votes. Yeah. Uh, and in, in the case of Tanzania, we see a similar thing. Uh, so the paper in Tanzania, we, we actually, we look at the same policy, increasing access to education at the secondary school level over three electoral cycles. And what we see is that the promise to uh, provide uh, secondary schools at every ward in Tanzania actually boosted uh, CCM's vote share. Vote share was declining, but declined at a lower rate in places that uh, did not have secondary schools. Uh, however, by the second uh, election, there's a slight electoral penalty in places that actually had schools uh, because the experience wasn't so good. Some of the schools were not of high quality. And then even though they were supposed to be provided by the government, there was quite a, a bit of local taxation uh, because communities were supposed to build the schools and then government would provide supplies and teachers. Right, you got to mold the bricks. If you don't yes. mold the bricks, the government's not right. going to show up with, you know, all the, the, the tin roof to put on yeah. the, yeah. And you so, see I mean, this play out in Ghana too. Yeah. With, with you know, universal... Uh, secondary education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I think what we're seeing is is you know is is uh, a nice density now of research about this sort of policy feedback mechanisms in African countries, and I think there's a lot more to be done. Uh, right, um, it is true. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Robin Hardin's work on uh, education also shows that uh, electoral competition, uh, together with Sasavage, uh, right boosts government's uh, willingness to invest in these broad-based public goods uh, and services. Yeah, um, and, then Jamie, and then Jamie Black's book too, that just the yeah. process mm -hmm. of through education like creates citizens, right? Yeah, so yeah, I think, and you know, one of, one of the questions that I'm, uh, I'm looking at now in my, in my work on uh, devolution in Kenya is asking this question of, does access to public goods and services actually create citizens and, and mm -hmm. willingness to participate uh, uh, more broadly? Because, uh, you know, that's what will help governments build these policy channels that they can use during emergencies like this, right? When you have an extension service that will know, you know, we had 60 bags last year, perhaps due, because of the outbreak, we're only going to get 45. How do we bridge the gap, uh, right? It's by having those established ways of linking to voters and households that governments will have the capacity to make uh, policy. Otherwise, you know, without that, they do what they do now, which is build infrastructure and hope for the best. 
Yeah, and and this yeah. brings me actually to something that Peter brought up earlier about remittances. So, um, so I have some work with Gabriella Montanola, who's a political scientist at UC Davis, looking at remittances in Africa, and and it's um, what we see with political participation. And um, and and yes, Peter, as you said, right, remittances are down. So there's not great numbers on remittances. We have to rely on um, on on officially mm -hmm. reported remittance data from um, from the World Bank. Um, but some of the early reports, I saw The Economist had a, an article a couple of weeks ago, some of the early reports, right, or the remittances are down quite a lot. So um, one uh, remitter in Italy said remittances to the continent were down 80%, right? Mm -hmm. So so um, just based on anecdotal data from different um, remittance uh, finance organizations are, are that remittances to the continent are actually down quite a bit. Um, and you know, obviously that's going to have an impact on ordinary people who have been relying on these um, on these remittances. Now, one potential outcome of this, though, is that people who get remittances tend to be isolated from the state. Right. Mm -hmm. So because yep. you get remittances, you don't have to go complain to, you know, your local MP because that guy's not going to do anything for you anyway. So why waste your time? you know, you can dig your own borehole with the money that so-and-so is sending back from their job as a nurse in the National Health Service in the UK, right? Um, but when that stops coming in, right, um, you have to start engaging with your local yeah. politicians, right? And so, um, you know, not that I want people's livelihoods to be cut off. I, I do think that there might, that COVID-19 and the reduction of remittances might have an impact on citizens' demands for the state exactly. to provide goods and services that they were trying to um, come together themselves and provide, right? We know that remittances have been used in migrants' hometowns to build schools, to build clinics, right? These, these public goods and services that should have been built by the state. Right, um, but once that that link is no longer available, then people, you know, people are going to have to go to the state to to get them to provide the services they should be providing in the first place. Yeah, there's been this phenomenon for decades of governments sort of load shedding certain functions, uh, either to donors or to compensatory uh, finance mechanisms like remittances, um, and there's been obviously, as, as Ken referenced at the beginning of his comments, the whole structure, long, deep structures of self-help uh, and, and social resilience uh, among uh, different communities, families, uh, and social uh, formations uh, across Africa. So I, we have a couple of questions, and um, they dovetail with this, the, the recent, you know, the last comments that uh, we were that you were both making uh, about whether or not there might be uh, a kind of a, a compel a forced uh, interface between governments and citizens uh, that would raise the issue of a social contract and raise the issue of public goods in new and more urgent uh, and salient ways so let me ask this in a couple of different ways reflecting on some of the questions that we're seeing one interpretation or one direction we could take this, this question is to say um, that in countries that are uh, more democratic, let's say, uh, where there's uh, more competition uh, and, and perhaps more open flow of information, that uh, in some of those countries, there will be better responses and better outcomes than others and that a better response by government or the perception of a better response by the population may provide you know, a legitimacy dividend and increased political support because people in country X will say, well, we did better than our neighbors. We did better than the country that really tanked uh, next door or across the continent. Uh, we're gonna support our government because they, they seem to handle this crisis well. The flip side of that, which is being asked by a couple of people in the in the Q and A here, is what about uh, the opportunities for authoritarians to manipulate the crisis uh, through crackdowns, through uh, heavy-handed use of security forces, uh, and those those sorts of uh, interventions, including uh, as we see in particularly. We're seeing a bit of this in East Africa, you know, populist responses which combine 
both heavy handed uh, security restrictions with uh, the, the allure of miracle cures. Uh, we're seeing that a bit in, in uh, Madagascar and in Tanzania now. So I wonder how you think about that relationship and how, what, what kinds of pathways or, or outcomes we might see. Kim? Well, you're the guy who does all the authoritarian stuff, Ken. <laughs> I yeah, feel so... like we start with the dictators first. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, uh, plus, I should say that, you know, even autocratic regimes have some, you know, sort of moral compact, implicit moral compact. So that it, when they completely fail, even they would be in danger, uh, right? Uh, you know, even the Ethiopian regime, right, has had to respond uh, very rapidly. Uh, I know it's, it's democratizing, but the architecture is still very autocratic. Uh, Rwanda similarly has been forced to, uh, uh, to try and contain the outbreak. I, th I think, I think, I think the, the separation here will be between the high capacity autocrats that have systems that allow them to do things uh, uh, and autocracies like Chad uh, that basically, you know, will, uh, will hope for the best, uh, right? So I, I think outcomes in, because Rwanda, uh, right? R Rwanda's implicit compact is that we will do well by you uh, while, you know, jailing people and suppressing the opposition, et cetera. Uh, and so if they fail and they, you know, they mass numbers of people die, then that compact will be broken. And I think even Kagame will be in trouble in such a scenario. Uh, now, you know, with, with democracies uh, or, you know, quasi democracies, I think, again, you know, the, the separating factor here will be uh, capacity. Uh, uh, you know, I, 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 I still, I'm, you know, I, I, I still struggle to provide the link between, you know, because every election comes up with, come, brings up so many issues that voters have to think about. Uh, it's often hard for me to, to, to figure out how, you know, voters would think about one particular issue. And so I think governments know that and their ability to do well in a crisis like this will often depend not just about, you know, they're thinking about the next election, but whether they have the capacity to actually do what they need to do. And I think both with democracies and autocracies, that will be the separation with some margins of incentives, electoral incentives uh, playing a role here and there. Yeah, I mean, I think it's gonna matter, like the timing matters, right? So I have this paper that I wrote a long time ago about time horizon. So how leaders think about how, you know, what they imagine is the length of time they'll be in office, whether they're autocrats or Democrats, right? Um, so, so if someone thinks they're going to be in office for a really long time, you know, they may act accordingly. They may not worry about this as much because, you know, this is just kind of a blip on the radar. I'm, you know, I'm Robert Mugabe. I'm going to live to like 90 something and I'm going to rule the whole time. Right. Um, was how Robert Mugabe, um, you know, I would imagine would, would think about these things. But someone like Peter Mutarika, who's the incumbent president of Malawi, um, who you know has never won a majority of support in an election, and whose most recent re-election to the presidency was nullified by a high court decision, and has to face a fresh election in July. You know, um, I would think he's incentivized to do better. He's not doing better, but I would I would imagine right the electoral incentives would suggest right that he wouldn't do you know kind of um, repressive quarantining lockdowns because you know Malawi's economy depends incredibly on you know as as Ken puts in scare quotes the informal sector right and you know people have day-to-day -day livings so they, they have that the, they need access to markets each day in order to be able to feed their families um, but he and his administration is so wildly out of touch with um, how everyday Malawians live that they're like, well, just shelter in place for three weeks. You know, you can't do that. Like if, yeah. if I'm buying food for my family every single day, because that's all the money I have is what I made that day, then I can't yeah. quarantine in place for three weeks. And, you know, I think he faces, a, you know, he faces a serious consequence in that, you know, there should be elections in July, um, you know, to determine whether he gets to maintain office. Um, you know, and so for him, I think it matters much more than, um, you know, someone who doesn't have an election for quite some time, you know, but I think that 
the places that have elections scheduled for 2020, I think that's where we really need to pay um, close attention. And then, you know, I mean, I think that this, we're going to be looking at this, um, this emergency for a long time, right? So I think it's, it's only 10 years from now where we're going to be able to say, you know, the decisions that leaders made in Ghana, you know, that year, because it was an election year, you know, is very different than the decisions, you know, made in South Africa, where it was not an election year. You know, I think that, you know, the timing of things is really going to matter. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. That's a really important point. And you think about Abi Ahmed in Ethiopia, you think about Nana Kupo Otto. I mean, they very different circumstances in the two countries, but, uh, elections where there's a degree of uncertainty and where, as you, as you rightly, as you so clearly put it, uh, they're going to be incentivized to think about how they handle this crisis and what the perceptions are going to be and what the circumstances are going to be uh, when the elections come around. Um, there is a, a, there are a set of questions here, which I, you know, I think we can uh, actually respond to very quickly. Uh, one person asks is, can we assume the rate of testing is the same? Uh, across countries in Africa, um, and and uh, when we're talking about this, what kind of uh, you know confidence do we have in the data based on uh, consistency and com com comparability across countries? And I think the short answer is uh, there's none. Um, is that there are countries like, if I'm not mis mistaken, I believe it's Niger who said that they have. Uh, available tests in the single digits um, and other countries wow. that have, you know, pretty substantial tests, but very uneven. And even if you look at the OECD countries, obviously the, the per capita testing uh, varies wildly uh, mm -hmm. across OECD states uh, in Asia, in Europe, in North America. So uh, what we know is that generally speaking, uh, there's a, an acute shortage of tests, uh, in, including near zero testing in quite a number of countries. And so we yeah. have very uneven statistics. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, I don't know if you all have seen this, but Al Jazeera English has reported multiple times about a $1 test that Senegal was developing. I've seen uh, that. Yeah. 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 I cannot find more about it. So every time I click on it, it's like it's just mentioned as as a sentence in the in the article, but there's no like link. There's no follow up. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, um, I that of course, like it raises my optimism, right? And I need that right now. But um, but I wish I knew more because, you know, as Peter rightfully said, there is a global shortage of testing, and it's uneven who has tests, right? Um, even here in the United States, right? Even places that have tests, they may not have the reagents or the swabs to do the collections to actually do the testing, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so you know, and I worry about that in in um, places where health resources are 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 generally in short supply. Um, but but I'm so curious about these dollar tests in Senegal and whether they can be mass produced and if this is you know, I mean, I'm much more interested in that. Then CVO, this, you know, this claim that CVO, this organic solution based on Artemisia and various other things in Madagascar is some sort of cure. I, I want to learn more about this dollar Senegal test. So if there's any journalists in the room, like, please report on that. Well, Adia, Adia is on, on the thread here, and she says that, uh, reminds us that the Senegalese test is, this, uh, is in partnership with a UK company, I think, and uh, was told, she was told it's an antibody test. Um, oh. And, you know, we're he also hearing reports in the U.S. of a, uh, a saliva-based antibody test that is, you know, also a, almost an instant test. So they're cheap. They have high, you know, they have high rates of, of false positives and false readings and so forth. But compared to nothing, uh, it yeah. seems like that that would be a, a fairly dramatic uh, improvement, uh, even even if there was a a fifteen percent error rate uh, in in the results. It would at least give you some kind of approximation, so you're not flying a plane in the Andes in the clouds with no instruments. Yeah, I mean, so Peter, your point your point just reminded me of you know so. Uh, 
as, as, as part of this uh, thinking about this epidemic, I've been thinking about, you know, policymaking and the, and the process of policymaking. And, uh, and I'm trying to, you know, putting together a, a longer academic piece on this. And, you know, it's, it's uh, the way we're observing, you know, governments in less developed countries and in wealthy countries as well respond to the crisis. And, you know, uh, yes, this is somewhat of a state of exception, but uh, this is how policy gets made, right? The evidence is often patchy, uh, you know, people satisfy, right? You, you know, mm -hmm. your point about, you know, it's better than nothing, right? Uh, different pressure groups want different things. The business people want to reopen yesterday. Public mm -hmm. health folks are more cautious, mm -hmm. uh, right? And so uh, governments won't just look at evidence and then make policy, right? Uh, there's nothing like that that's happening. You're looking at different things at different times and balancing different uh, uh, ideas from different interest groups. And, and I think uh, it's, it's high time that, you know, when we think about everyday policymaking, uh, we make that apparent that, you know, this is how it's done even in non-emergency situations, right? That policymaking often involves inputs from different interests. Uh, and that's how we should think about, you know, education policy in Zambia or, you know, uh, ag policy in Malawi. It's not just, here's a solution, apply it, and everyone agrees because it's self-evident that this is the right solution. Let me um, uh, take us in a slightly different direction and also respond to uh, a thread that I'm seeing in a lot of the Q&A. Um, and that is, has to do with the external relations uh, of this uh, emergency and, and this crisis. Um, one possibility is that it will shift relations toward China, although it could shift relations toward China in a decidedly negative direction. If there's a perception that China takes a hard line on debt negotiations or, or, or debt rescheduling, uh, I think that's going to shift uh, perceptions in a, you know, very, in a very negative direction. On the other hand, if Jack Ma and the Chinese government are shipping in N95 masks and, and spit tests and swabs and so forth, that could shift it in a decidedly positive direction. There's also the African, uh, you know, free trade uh, agreement and the idea that there could be uh, regional relationships or around uh, medical supplies or, or medications or, or other kinds of economic relationships if connectivity to Europe or to North America or to Asia is now limited uh, for a time. Uh, so how might this affect the international relations uh, of Africa in terms of uh, uh, trade, in terms of uh, aid relations, in terms of uh, finance? Um, I, I think, you know, the, the China question is still, it's still an open question uh, because, so on, on the one hand, uh, there's the possibility that China doesn't uh, respond to African calls for debt uh, forgiveness uh, or relief, at, at least uh, during the calendar year. Um, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't think it would be in China's incentive to have mass default on the continent, across the continent, uh, right? It's, it's, it's one thing to run a port in Sri Lanka. Uh, I don't think China has the capacity to run multiple infrastructure installations across Africa. Uh, so, you know, the optimal policy for China would be to perhaps uh, uh, forgive debt repayments for some time so that uh, those loans are not in default uh, moving forward. And I think, I think post-crisis, uh, what will probably happen will, will also depend on how uh, traditional relationships with Europe and North America play out. Uh, if, if Europe and North America are not forthcoming in, in building stronger economic ties and providing tangible support for African governments, then China will be the uh, natural alternative. Uh, and, and, and if and when that happens, then uh, it may help get over some of the hiccups that we've seen during the, the, the current crisis, including the attacks on Africans uh, in Guangzhou uh, and the negative press uh, uh, for China that that has generated uh, across African countries. 
Yeah, I was going to bring that up in particular. Um, mm -hmm. that, you know, so there are these four Nigerians who had tested positive in Guangzhou and following media reports of that, um, you know, there was increasingly um, discriminatory and, and even violent acts towards Africans broadly in Guangzhou. And then, um, I mean, you're seeing, like, I don't know if you all are getting this in your WhatsApp messages, but, but you're seeing forwards of um, Africans trying to enter, you know, supermarkets in China and being denied mm -hmm. access, you know, just as, you know, Chinese or white people are able to get into these same stores, right? Africans are being denied access. Um, and I think that, you know, those kinds of human to human relationships really matter. So like how, how Africans are treated abroad, right? That's, um, you know, Africans who travel abroad, right? They, um, they have influence. And, um, you know, even, you know, people who are undocumented, right, and, and are kind of um, struggling to, to, to make a living, like, even they have some influence, you know, the, many of them were people who were sending remittances to family back home, right? So, so they, you know, they have an important network. Um, and I think that, you know, the, tr the maltreatment of Africans in the abroad is, is likely to have um, really important consequences for foreign relations in, in ways that it's probably too early to know now. But I don't think that that, you know, that's limited to China, though that of course is, is the best reported on, right? There's the repatriation of many undocumented migrants from Gulf states, right? So we've got charter planes filled with Ethiopians who are being sent back to Ethiopia, right? With no social distancing or measures for their health at all, because there's this concern or um, stereotype, right? Just, which is unfortunately universal in the human experience that migrants somehow are more likely to carry disease, right? And part of that is, um, you know, obviously, like, given the fact that, you know, these, these people are working in, um, in cramped quarters and or living in cramped quarters and, and so unable to protect themselves from getting sick, should anyone, you know, that they live or work with get ill. Um, but, you know, we saw this in the AIDS epidemic when South Africa sent back Malawian miners en masse, right, when, when they did um, HIV testing of, of um, people working in the mines and saw that there were higher rates of HIV among Malawians than among people from other countries. And so it turned into this whole thing where, you know, um, now South Africa is against Malawians because they sent these miners back home. Um, so I think that even, you know, given that we know that so much migration happens on the continent and not beyond it, I think it's going to be important to see too um, how infections that are crossing borders are going to shape the way, shape the relations of countries going forward, right? So I remember just this weekend, one of the most recent cases in Uganda was actually um, a truck driver from Tanzania, right? And so I'll be curious to follow some of the rhetoric that political leaders are using regarding who are the people getting infected and who are bringing in infections, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and, and the treatment of people from those groups, even if they themselves are not infected and, and what that might mean for relations between those countries in the future. Yeah, so, exactly. I mean, the stigmatization and characterization among countries on the continent and of course, between, between regions is, yeah. is critical. And we're reminded of course, that the so-called Spanish flu of 1918 originated in Kansas, Kansas. Yeah. Um, and, and became, uh, uh, became designated as something else. Sorry, Ken, did you have a comment? Yeah, I, th I think uh, one thing that I forgot to mention is that uh, one of the, uh, what, what I hope will be one of the outcomes of, of, of this crisis and how China handles its debt, uh, its loans to African countries, is that it will bring it to the fore even more clearly that the Africa-China relationship has been a commercial relationship as opposed to a donor relationship. Yeah, I, th I think I think that there's often mm -hmm. the misperception that you know uh, China is just bankrolling African countries, but uh, I, th I think you know, if China plays hardball, it will remind everyone that these are commercial loans that African countries have to pay back, uh, and that on the China side uh, there will be some learning that. Uh, if you want to have your loans repaid, uh, you better invest in commercially viable uh, investment uh, as opposed to, you know, white elephants that will not uh, pay back. Um, well, we're at time. Kim, did you have any final words that you wanted to add? 
Um, I just want to say, I, I so I saw in the Q&A, uh, Chato Nwankor had a question oh, yes. about a gendering policy. And so um, as as we, we close it out, I do, um, I do think Please. this is really important. And, um, you know, and, and of course, Chato is a, a great scholar of gender and politics uh, on the continent. So, so it, I'm not surprised that she would ask this really important question. And I alluded to it earlier in talking about African leaders and how so many of them are men. Um, as we see the, um, as we learn more about the disease and who it affects and, and who it infects, um, I think it's going to be really important for us to, um, to think of the entire population and not just men. Right, and I think that um, that that that's going to be important, not just for um, the short-term consequences of lockdowns and quarantines for um, gender-based violence, which is what Chiodo is asking about, um, but you know, just the um, the gendered labor of um, of taking care of families and households uh, that is typically unpaid. I think thinking about all of the gendered nature of um, how the disease and the, the pandemic are affecting whole populations and not just um, some populations is going to be important for um, for communities and especially for political leaders to think about. Thank you. That's an essential question and it, and it got uh, a little bit sidelined as we scroll down the list of questions. Um, I can't thank you both enough for you know a great conversation. Obviously this could continue uh, for quite some time uh, but Hopefully we'll be back uh, to revisit some of these issues. Um, and we really covered an, an enormous uh, range of uh, issues related to uh, the pandemic, policy responses, politics on the continent, the international politics of the continent, differential effects on different communities and groups, uh, and what the possible outcomes and, and pathways might be. So we'll uh, come back to this, of course, and uh, thanks again for joining us and contributing your, your really insightful uh, perspectives and thanks to our audience. Yes, thanks, thanks all. Peter. Okay. And thanks to your team at SICE. We really appreciate it. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, guys. thank you. Great job. Everybody did a great job. Thanks to Allison, Kense, and particularly Sonia. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.